afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Dave Deptula, Dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Studies, and welcome to our Schriever Space Power Forum. I'd like to welcome retired General Kevin Chilton, our Explorer Chair for Space Warfighting Studies here at Mitchell Institute's Space Power Analysis Center of Excellence, also referred to as MI Space, who will be moderating a much anticipated discussion with our special guest today, General Jay Raymond, Chief of Space Operations for the U.S. Space Force. Uh, General Raymond, Happy New Year to you, and thanks Thank you. very much for taking the time to uh, do this. And without further ado, General Chilton, over to you. Thanks, General Deptula. It's a great day for Mitchell Space. It's great to have Thank you sir. here, Chief. And you, uh, you do us an honor by being here. And I know our audience and all those of us here at Mitchell Space are anxious to hear from you. So why don't we begin by giving you an opportunity to say a few words. All right. I kick off the show. It. Thank you. First of all, Happy New Year, everybody. And it's great to be back at the Mitchell Institute. Sir, it's, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Uh, we in the space community were very lucky for years to have you on the team uh, internal, to the, inter, internal to the force and um, really have been such a, a great advocate for us and a mentor to all of us. And it's really good to continue to have the opportunity to work closely with you and appreciate Thank very you, much uh, you. the opportunity to have a conversation. You know, it's, it's hard to believe uh, that we're only two years old. I mean, if you think about it, we're two years and less than a month old. Uh, and if you look at if you look at the body of work that has been done, it's pretty incredible. I've said this numerous times. I would have flunked the test if you had told me at the two year mark we've gotten all of this done. So I thought what I might do is just spend a couple minutes, uh, kind of bringing the the group up to speed on on where we we Great. are, Great. Uh, and then get into your dialogue and 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 really focus on the way forward from here. Uh, but I, I think one of the big things is that all the major um, organizational uh, big, big muscle movements have been, have been put in place. Uh, we've got the headquarters designed and, and implemented. That started out being a, an over 1,000 person headquarters. We slashed that back to 600 because uh, we wanted to be small and be able to go fast. Uh, that's in, in place. The leadership is in place. We're still hiring folks, but uh, up and running and have our legs under us and, and making a difference. The three field commands are up. And, um, and that we completed the last two of those kind of midway through uh, la this second year. And so now we've got uh, Space Operations Command, Space Systems Command, and our newest command, the STAR Command, uh, up and running as well. Uh, and, and and continuing to build those, those organizations out. We also have 15 mission-focused deltas. Uh, and if you recall, sir, back when uh, under Air Force Space Command, we had wings and groups mm -hmm. and we slashed bureaucracies and stood up 106 level command and really made them mission-focused. And so all of those are established and, and doing well. And then we have three garrison commands up and running as well, uh, leading uh, Buckley, Los Angeles, and then uh, a combined um, uh, Peterson, Schriever, uh, Cheyenne Mountain uh, Garrison, to, again, to have efficiencies. On the personnel side, uh, what started with one person in the Space Force today, we have uh, 13,525 to be exact as of this morning, almost exactly 50% military, 50% civilian, We're split almost right down the middle. Uh, included in those are the beginnings of inner service transfers from other services. We've selected 720. Uh, those folks are in the process of, of uh, transitioning into, into the Space Force. We've developed a, a human capital strategy and have laid out uh, core values for, for our service. We've put all the promotion boards in place. And if you recall, uh, one, of the, one of the items that Congress highlighted to us when we were looking to establish the Space Force was the, the lack of promotion rates in the Air Force for space professionals. That's now all been, all been, uh, been changed. Uh, we've completely overhauled the force development of how we take a guardian uh, from uh, either basic training or, or uh, um, commissioning programs uh, and have robusted the, the professional development of those guardians to be able to operate more effectively in a warfighting domain. We've overhauled the recruiting process. You know, when, when we recruit, we recruit only about 500 enlisted air, uh, guardians a year and ab about it, just shy of that on the officer side. You can do things differently. And so what we've done is we've, we've implemented working with the recruiting command, something called centralized booking. So if you're, a, if you're a, a high school student in L.A. and you go to the recruiter and say, I want to go to the Space Force, uh, we, we look for those recruiting stations to build our talent pool, if you are the the, the group of people that are interested. And then we have a centralized board. We're the most selective service that there is. 
uh, and and then we pick centrally. So we make sure that we pick the 500 best, not maybe the first person that came in mm -hmm. off the street. Uh, and that's paying huge dividends for us as well. Uh, we actually are meeting our recruiting goals and have more people in the hopper wanting to come in. And again, uh, being able to uh, to recruit some really incredible folks. One of the values of this is uh, when we were in the Air Force, the diversity uh, uh, makeup of our service was about 17%. Today, with the with the new assessments coming in, we're at 31.5%. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing value a, a, across the board uh, with that centralized booking. Uh, our budget. So we've just submitted our second budget. I will tell you the first budget uh, that we submitted, we submitted when we were like a month old. It was right at the beginning. So this budget that that was submitted is really the first big budget that the, mm -hmm. the Space Force uh uh, worked and, and, and submitted on our own. I think once that budget is released, you'll see a very bold, uh, very bold budget uh, as it relates to, to space and, and being able to shift to a more uh, resilient architecture. We've also talked, uh, built and orchestrated a new capability development program. Uh, one of the big um, discussion points when we were looking to establish a separate service was how do you build capability at speed? How do you get capability, warfighting capability in the hands, hands of our uh, operators at, at, at tactically relevant timelines? And so what we've learned is, what I've learned is, it's not just the acquisition part. It's, the, it's an entire process from force design to requirements to acquisition and testing. Uh, and so in the National Defense Authorization Act that was just signed, it designates, uh, tells the uh, task Secretary of Defense to designate the Space Force as the lead for pulling that force design together for the Secretary of Defense. Uh, the JROC signed a memo on the requirement side that established the Space Force as the lead joint uh, service for joint space requirements. So now we have the force design work solidified. Uh, we've got the requirements uh, part solidified. The acquisition process, we've, we've stood up Space Systems Command. We've continued to tweak that. We've worked very closely with, with Congress to make sure that uh, we're, we're listening to their voices as well on, on, uh, on how that, is, on how that uh, is architected, if you will. And I'm very comfortable we landed in a great spot there. And then one of the things that we didn't have a robust capability on is a testing program. As you know, and we had a very small portion that did testing uh, under AFOTEC and the Air Force. We now have designed a test program uh, that will uh, fully mature here over the, over the coming over the coming years. So, on the capability development front, I, I couldn't be more more thrilled uh, with with where we are. There's a lot of work to do, but the foundations, if you will, are in place. And probably the most consequential work we've done is on that force design, and we established an organization. Um, uh, to do that force design work. Uh, and I'll tell you, I can talk more about that as we go into Q&A, but uh, they, they are uh, doing really good work and uh, it's probably the most important work uh, that we've got uh, ongoing as we speak. Now, we've also integrated uh, space more effectively, I think, into the department strategy and, and, and um, doctrine documents. We've, we've uh, um, published our first doctrine uh, it was a capstone doctrine. We just signed out our second one, which is a space uh, planning, uh, Space Force Doctrine Document 5.0, which is about planning. Um, on the strategy piece, uh, when the national defense strategy comes out, when the national military strategy comes out, when the joint warfighting construct uh, comes out, I think um, folks will see a more uh, space more integrated into those strategic uh, documents of our department, which, which are so important. And then, um, uh, on the intelligence side, we've upped our game on the intelligence business. We've established a, a, an intelligence delta uh, that uh, brings that that consolidates intelligence, operational level intelligence for the force. That's called uh, Delta Seven. Uh, and then what we've done is we put detachments at each one of our mission-focused deltas, uh, an intelligence detachment. So we actually have intelligence experts sitting next to our operational experts, and and in some cases our cyber experts that are on the floor with us as well. Uh, all mission focused, uh, and I'll tell you that that has also been a significant uh, uh, ad advancement uh, as we've gone forward. Um, and then the last piece I'd highlight before we get into robust Q and A is our in international partnerships. Uh, I couldn't be more pleased uh, with what we have done uh, with our international partners, largely transforming uh, transforming partnerships from one way data sharing partnerships to more two-way operationally focused and operationally relevant partnerships where we're exercising together, wargaming together, developing tactics, techniques, procedures together, linking our operational centers together, and now developing capabilities together. 
And in this force design work that we're doing, uh, I really believe we have an opportunity to uh, bring our international partners and uh, commercial industry uh, uh, more into the fold as we, as we build that uh, design going forward. And so, as I said, uh, a lot has been done in just two short years. Now we've got the foundation. Now we've got to drive hard and deliver advantage for our country as we've been doing all along. Terrific. By the way, a belated happy second birthday. Thank this you. This past December for you and all the guardians. We're in our terrible twos. Yep, terrible twos. Okay, we'll that's make right. some noise. Yeah. And it sounds like yeah. you are making yeah. great progress. But uh, so that's a great rundown over the past two years. And you're right, it's impressive. But um, what are your priorities coming up in year three? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd love to uh, spend some time on that. Um, I'll tell you, as we've, over the last couple of months, have been putting our, our head together on kind of what's, what's year three about. Um, uh, it is clear that uh, there's still a lot of work to do. And I think year three is going to be even more consequential than year two. And let me highlight a couple areas, several areas that we're focused on. I mentioned the force design work. We have got to shift uh, the space architecture, if you will, uh, from uh, a handful of exquisite capabilities that are very hard to defend to a more robust, more resilient architecture by design. That's what this force design work is, is doing. The very first work we did was on missile warning and missile tracking. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that work uh, not was not just done by the Space Force, but we brought together a broad team across the department where it was Space Force folks plus Missile Defense Agency plus the NRO plus Space Development Agency all came together and um, came up with a force design that I think is, is uh, a winning design for the future. And so we will pivot, uh, begin our pivot uh, significantly to a, a resilient architecture this next year. Uh, that same work, that force design work is also doing work on what a ground moving target indicator uh, uh, capability would look like in space. And so they're leading the AOA in partnership with a, with a broad community, including the intelligence community, uh, including CAPE uh, in the department to come up with what's the right answer for that that doesn't duplicate uh, capabilities that are already that already been done, but provide uh, really meaningful capabilities in the hands of the warfighter. Uh, and the last piece that we're working on on the design for this year uh, is a space data transport layer. As you collect data in space, you have to have the ability to move that data uh, at speed uh, across the globe. And we're we're doing the design work. All three of those design efforts: missile warning, missile tracking, which is the furthest along and and really has been delivered. And then the, the tactical level ISR, if you will, with GMTI, and then the space data transport layer are all uh, being done to, to, uh, to help inform the 24, the 24 budget. Terrific. One of the things that our secretary of the Air Force uh, has asked us to do is to really take a hard look at tactical level ISR. And so, and, and, and if you look at the joint force requirements, um, uh, responsibilities that we were given by the by the JROC, uh, the very first thing we're doing is going to reach out to all the other services and in, in doing this in partnership with the intelligence community is get our arms around what are the department's tactical level ISR, war fighting, targeting ISR uh, requirements, and, and, and pull those together. And then again, working with the intelligence community, figure out the best way going forward on, on meeting those on meeting those requirements. On the force development work, uh, we've done a lot of work this year and study this year on the reserve integration into the mm -hmm. into the Space Force. Um, the, the National Defense Authorization Act uh, uh, tells us to study that some more this year. And my goal is this year to be able to deliver something that, that we can get a decision on uh, to, to uh, effectively integrate. We also need to look at the service, the Space Force's overlay, if you will, of U.S. Space Command and make sure that we have the right uh, service uh, uh, capabilities lined up to support that new command as well. Uh, so that, that's an area that, that we'll work on. Uh, this year, our, our plan was on 1 October, we've agreed with the Army and the Navy on what capabilities should, should transfer from those services into the Space Force, specifically communications organizations associated with either narrowband or wideband uh, SATCOM. Uh, those capabilities are on hold uh, coming over until we get uh, past the CR. Uh, and then we'll bring those over. And then uh, there's a couple other capabilities that we're looking to bring over as well. And, and we'll, we'll uh, get that finalized this, this year as we speak. Um, on the force generation uh, model, uh, 
we are working and have developed a force generation and readiness model for space. Uh, it's not a deployed uh, model because a very few uh, pieces of our of our force actually deploy into the into AORs, but it's a more uh, employed in place. And how how do you best measure that readiness? How do you present those forces and generate those forces for combatant commands? We've got those models um, uh, about done, and, and we look forward to to bring uh, bring those to fruition as well. Part of that is when we were in the Air Force, our force presentation model was all done through the air component. And so today in theaters around the globe, we have air component commanders presenting space force capabilities and that's, that doesn't work. And so we're gonna stand up component commands and the, the regional combatant commands to be able to do the ADCON to have guardians take care of guardians, but to also better integrate space into theater. And by having those robust uh, com components uh, in thought, if you will, they're not big in numbers, but having a dedicated uh, space force element in those commands will also help strengthen the overall U.S. Space Command's ability to, to conduct global operations. Um, and so that's on the force uh, force generation. On the acquisition business, and this is largely not a chief service chief function, it's, it's more of a secretary function, but uh, the National Defense Authorization Act said we could establish a separate space, space SAE no later than one October 22, rather than one October 22, an individual is going through the, the nomination confirmation process. We look forward to getting that uh, official on board and get the space uh, SAE up and running and, and, and uh, uh, helping us uh, move forward on that front. On the strategy part, as I mentioned up front, there's a lot of work being done on, on integrated deterrence. In fact, I appreciate your help tomorrow when we, we bring together a forum to talk about integrated deterrence. Um, uh, we've got you know the national security uh, national security strategy, national defense strategy, national military strategy, um, the joint war funding contract that continues to mature, and so all of those are work that we'll continue to to put our focus on. And then finally, uh, and probably most important, is that we want to deliver for guardians and their families. And when you have a service that is uh, thirteen thousand people strong, uh, you can do things differently. You can apply a little bit more art than science when you manage careers. Mm -hmm. uh, you can have a connection with guardians and their families. And if you're largely doing it employed in place in, in certain hubs around the country, it, it might drive different answers on the professional development side. And so we've developed this strategy. We wanna fully implement that strategy and deliver again for our guardians and their families, which is the source of our strength. Great. And so that's kind of what we've got initially focused on on year three. There's a ton of work to do but we're excited to roll up our sleeves. And, yeah, it sounds and like about it. two years of work that you got planned yeah, for one yeah, more year, which right. is kind of in the pace you're at anyway. Yeah. But to your last point, is, is that your, your focus on the families, on the guardian way of life, if you will, and service, is, that, uh, is there a retention part of that strategy? I think, I think there is definitely a retention part of that strategy. Um, I think there's an accession part, a retention mm -hmm. development part, and, a, and a, a retention part. And I think if you look at um, uh, being able to build the force that we need, uh, it's going to help in all, in all of those in all of those fronts. It's a very bold strategy. Uh, we we reached out to to folks outside the department uh, that are experts in this business to help mm -hmm. us build that. Uh, it's very forward leading, and I think it's going to really pay dividends. It, it already is. Well, it, it's it's great. I, I have a chance every now and then to speak up at the Air Force Academy. And I remember when I retired back in 2012, there was I think 13 astro majors in the senior class. And 10 okay. were going to pilot training. That, so th there was only three assessing to Air Force Space Command. And that has changed. And the level of enthusiasm, I'll tell you, really sharp cadets uh, at, at my alma mater there that are studying astro astronautical engineering and they want to be in the space force. Yeah, we had, we as you know, sir, had 118 get commissioned out of the last class, including a Rhodes Scholar. Uh, we've got folks at Harvard and MIT. We have folks getting master's degrees in Europe. I mean, really high caliber talent. We've also um, developed... Uh, university partnerships with about 10 other universities uh, are around the country, like Purdue, um, like Howard, mm -hmm. uh, uh, University of North Dakota, uh, Stanford. I mean, we've got the ones that are really steep aerospace in schools. aerospace schools. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, um, our goal is twofold on that. One, to ha do research collaboration uh, mm -hmm. with those universities. But two, if you look at the ROTC detachments and around the country in the Air Force. There's about, don't quote me on that, there are over 100, 100 and something ROTC detachments. What we would like to do is really kind of focus our talent in these schools that are really steeped in aerospace mm -hmm. 
And oh, by the way, if, you, if you're if uh, you a high school student that wants to come into the Space Force uh, I, on, and get commissioned, it, there's a very, very good chance almost all of them will get scholarships uh, to be able to, to go into those. If you, if you go to those schools, schools yeah. get a scholarship to, to do it. Uh, and so we think there's there's great opportunity there as well. And you got to retain the talent. Once you get then it. we have to be able to retain them. And yeah. so that that gets at, at how do you how do you develop them? Uh, how do you take care of them? And as you know, you you're, you recruit uh, guardians and you retain their families. Right. And so we we want to uh, take very good care of families uh, and and our guardians to make sure that, that they want to stay. Uh, and um, I think again with a with the so of the thirteen thousand ish the half civilians and, and the other thing we want to do is up our game on taking care of civilians mm -hmm. they're they're a critical part of our force Absolutely. uh you know 50 over 50 percent of our force uh, will be civilians uh we want to we want to make sure that we develop and take care of them as well but on the active duty side when you're when you're you know at, let's say 8400 ish by the end of the year you can pretty much know everybody yep. and so one of the things that we've done you know and rather than have promotion boards for our enlisted guardians or I'm sorry, rather than taking tests, uh, mm -hmm. uh, for testing for promotions, well, we're not doing any of that. We're having promotion boards because we can, because the numbers are so small. small. And so we can do things differently. And, and we think uh, we think it'll be uh, something that our, that our guardians will, will uh, benefit from. Terrific. You know, as I reflect about, back on the history of the Air Force and the early Army air power advocates, they started thinking about this uh, critical thing you've talked about already, designing a force structure. 20 years, more than 20 years before they became a separate service. Right. And so you're having to do this all simultaneously, the, right. the force design work you're doing. And the, the Space Warfighting Analysis Center, I think affectionately right. referred to as SWAC, right. is in charge of that. Do you, do you feel like they're getting, uh, like, I mean, they need tools to do right. their analysis and, and they need smart people. Are they getting the resources they need today to yeah. to do this hard work that you've described already? Yeah, it's a really small organization. We, we wanted yeah. to to limit bureaucracy and and focus on capability. And if you look at this group, it's a it's a very small group of PhD level folks, coupled with our best uh, and brightest operators and intel experts, mm -hmm. um, doing this design work. And if you look at what they've delivered for the missile warning, missile tracking, it, it's really really impressive work. And what I have found is when you have small teams like that that are really high powered, lots of people want to go work for them. Mm -hmm. And so they're attracting really incredible talent we just had they just hosted uh, a few months ago an industry day where we went to industry and said okay here's all of our design work and it wasn't a stack of documents this big it was models computer models mm -hmm. and said here's the simulation of what of what we're trying to do and here's here's the models of the threat mm -hmm. and here's what we think tell us what tell us how you would how you would do it because what I hear, what I hear too often when I go to industry is I'll hear, you know, you, you come in with a stack of requirements this big and you say, build this. And we're sitting there saying, we'd never build it that way. Okay, so now here's your chance. Yeah. Tell us what you would build and then run it through this design, the, the, the modeling, if you will, and see if it survives the threat. Mm -hmm. And if you have a better way of doing business, we'll incorporate it. We, we wanna move forward uh, for our nation at speed and the, the more voices we can have early on, uh, the better. So I, I, they've got a lot of work on their plate. They've done delivered the missile warning, missile tracking. As I mentioned, they're doing the GMTI work uh, to make sure that we've got that right. Uh, they're doing the space data transport layer, which is important as we, as we bring the space development agency into the Space Force and work with others that are also looking at layers. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll do that work. So they've got a lot of work on their plate, but they have incredible talent and their, their, their ability to attract talent is uh it's been uh significant great you know you've mentioned this the uh, uh the, the acquisition arm coming into right. uh, uh the department of the air force right. and um, the space development agency will move right. in this year as right. well as part of that acquisition team uh, authorities mm -hmm. that they'll have uh, you study things you look at new architectures but eventually someone has to slap the table and say that's what we're going to build mm -hmm. uh and is that your call and then the acquisition folks decide who's going who they're going to lay contracts in with to manage the program. Is that going to be the relationship between right. the department there, and a, the space force? Yeah, there, there's a matter of you know the 
typically on the service chief side, it's the requirements mm -hmm. and it's the force design work. And then in the secretary, it's the acquisition part. Right. Obviously our secretary is going to be very interested in the force design work as yeah. well. So um, uh, we're really lucky to have secretary Kendall mm -hmm. uh, on that. The other thing is the secretary of defense is also really the force design architect, if you will, for the, for the department, if you look at who's responsible. So if you look at what the law says, you know, it, it says secretary of defense delegate this down to, to the Space Force to do that work, we'll package that work up, uh, go through the normal oversight processes of the department. But we have the team and we have the relationships and we are pulling the department together for, you know, to, you know, as you know, there's this conversation of 60 different organizations that have a role in space. We now have a service that can bring unity of effort to bear, reduce duplication, in, increase our speed, and then uh, work the, the acquisition part uh, closely with with the secretariat who does the acquisition piece and as as i mentioned up front we're looking forward to to uh, having a, a assistant secretary for space acquisition integration mm -hmm. uh, in place that that person uh, that official will also have assistant secretary will also have saa authorities for for space and so we're eager to get that that up and running and and then uh and then bringing sda into that fold um uh what, what we really want to do with SDA, what the work that they're doing is really good work. And we've been working very closely with SDA for the last year. Our Secretary of the Air Force and um, uh, Dr. Shu's R&E have said, hey, we're going to start you know, doing quarterly meetings. They've already had one. Uh, quarterly touch points as we, as we lead up to 1 October when they come over. So when that transition happens, it happens seamlessly. Mm -hmm. and, and the capabilities they're developing, we, we have integrated into, for example, in missile warning, missile tracking, we've integrated into the broader force design work. We want those capabilities not just to be prototypes, but to no kidding, be part of our operational uh, weapons Capability. systems. Capabilities. Great, great. Let's we'll switch to intelligence. You brought sure. it up in your opening remarks. So right. It's great you have a Delta focused on it. Right. Um, so if I heard you right though, you're looking at pushing Intel support down to the SOPS level, the, the space operational squadron level, is that correct? Or is it gonna stay at the, at the Delta we, level? Or? We've got it at the Delta level and then, um, is a focus, but there are uh, there are intelligence experts that have also been assigned in, in squadron. So, for example, when you go to a missile warning squadron mm -hmm. today, like if you were to go up to Thule, Greenland, mm -hmm. you would see an intelligence professional Excellent. assigned there um, uh, that sits right there with the crew mm -hmm. that can provide them the intelligence needed to to understand the domain in which we're tasking them to to surveil and to have a, an understanding of. And so. Uh, I think that's probably one of the things, uh, one of the areas that I think we've made the most progress on is strengthening that intel. It, it was really lacking. Uh, Didn't exist. Yeah, it, no, and now, not too long. now we have a dedicated intel professional leading that organization with, with detachments that are mission focused. And so it's, it's not just uh, intelligence experts at, at, you know, out of Shriver. It's no, these folks are the experts at GPS, for example, or yeah. whatever. It's mission focused. Uh, intel experts that are sitting there side by side, left seat, right seat, if you will, making sure that the operators have what they need to have to operate in this domain. I know in the air domain that as a second lieutenant in my first squadron, there was an intel officer assigned in the squadron. Right. And it helped us stay educated on the threat, right. Uh, right. both fielded and what maybe the adversary was doing day in right. and day out. And Absolutely. I guess we weren't compelled to do that in the past because we didn't recognize space the warfighting domain. But now I'm glad to hear you're doing that. How about at the strategic level? I know uh, when I was at Stratcom, I was, I was um, disappointed is probably the wrong word, but I didn't feel like we were getting the support we needed out of a national intelligence, both in the in DIA and even at, in the Air Force at NASIC. Uh, and uh, are we building up that strategic intelligence analysis capability at NASIC? And are you pleased with what's happening? Yeah, we, uh, we are. Uh, in fact, one of the things I skipped over on, I, I could have gone on for mm -hmm. another hour on all the things that have happened in the first two years, but one of the things that happened last year, early on last year, was we became a uh, an 18th member of the intelligence community. That's all the other services are members. So this is normalized business yeah. that we're, we're a, a member of the intelligence community. That has helped us. Uh, we've also worked very closely with NASIC. What we wanted to do is really stand up, uh, enhance our intelligence capabilities without building bureaucracy. Uh, we wanna stay small, we wanna stay lean, we, wanna, we, we, we don't wanna focus on that, we wanna focus on getting intelligence in the hands of, of operators. And so there's a couple organizations that were, a couple organizations are part of NASIC 
that we brought over to the Space Force, but we left kind of embedded there with NASIC to put a little bit sharper focus on. We've, we've uh, established what we call a, a SOFIA Space Force Intelligence, intelligence uh, Activity uh, to, to start thinking through, uh, which basically allows uh, us to, to communicate directly, our, our S2, if you will, General Lauderback, to communicate directly uh, with, with NASIC. And then our plans are, and we're still working this uh, with Congress, our plans are to establish a National Space Intelligence Center, just like all other domains have, right. um, focused on this on the space domain without creating the bureaucracy. We want to leave it uh, embedded there with NASIC, co-located with NASIC, mm -hmm. so we can uh, um, gain the synergies of that. But we we want to um, put a little sharper focus and build up those intelligence uh, the intelligence focus on space as we move forward. Great, it's it was so invaluable in the old days. We called it FTD for air power. Right, to be able to hand a, a photograph of an airplane yeah. on the ramp in our adversary's backyard and them tell you exactly what that airplane could do because they were such right. good engineers and right. that's terrific that they're doing that. Yeah, so it, so we're making, that's another area, as I mentioned, that intelligence area is, is an area both operationally and then more strategically where mm -hmm. I think we've made we've made some pretty good progress. Terrific. And I'm much more comfortable that we're in a, a better position, better posture today than we were just two years ago. Yeah, great. Now there's, a, there's an old, couple old sayings, a lot of old sayings, but one was that uh, the adversary gets a vote on how things are going to go in the next conflict, or I guess another one is uh, no plan survives first contact with the enemy because they're thinking and they're going to do something perhaps different than what you anticipate. But, you know, Russia and China have made it pretty clear, I think, certainly China, what their intentions are if they get into a dust-up with us, and that is to go after our space capabilities because they know how we're dependent on them in every domain. Uh, what are your views on how we can best deter China and Russia from attacking our space assets? Should we should tensions rise? Yeah. So first of all, I think um, space. You know, people ask me all the time about, and we had this conversation the other day as we were preparing for the integrated deterrence mm -hmm. conference we're going to have. Um, people ask me all the time about space deterrence, and I always say there's no such thing as space deterrence. It's mm -hmm. just deterrence, mm -hmm. and and it's the deterrence calculus of imposing costs and denying benefits. Uh, that you really have to shape of an adversary to, to deter. Uh, we very uh, firmly believe that space can amplify those deterrence messages. And that's this whole integrated uh, deterrence concept that is kind of the foundation of a national defense strategy going forward and, and, and why we're uh, uh, integrated so closely into that, into that uh, the building of that and the drafting of that, of that document. Um, I think there's a couple things we can do. One, you have to uh, our, our big focus, as I mentioned in the force design, is shift to a, a more resilient architecture to make it harder uh, for an adversary to be able to, to um, uh, keep us from accessing the, that domain and keep us from the advantages that that access provides. I think um, there's a, a readiness part of this that, that they have to know that you're a credible force. So all the work that we're doing to build readiness is important. I think there's an international partnership piece of this. And as we, as we move forward, uh, we want to do this in conjunction with our international partners. I think there's a messaging part of this, uh, and and part of the work on reducing classification to be able to have a, a strategy on what do you reveal and what do you conceal uh, to better to, to deter is something that uh, we continue to to work on and and, and move forward on. I think there's uh, a training, and this is part of readiness, but training of our of our guardians. Uh, to, ha to have the ability to know that, that we can operate through this uh, contested domain and that, that um, uh, an adversary won't have luck in being able to keep us from accessing those. I think if we can do that, you actually uh, deter a conflict from not just um, uh, uh, occurring in the space domain, but you can also then keep it from, from spilling over into other domains. And I think that's this integrated deterrence piece that we really believe if you can deter a conflict from beginning or extending into space early, uh, then you might cause an adversary to pause and say, maybe I shouldn't spill it over into other domains because I, I can't win. Okay. But we have a, a very vulnerable architecture today and it's gonna take time to put that resilient architecture in place. So if deterrence fails, uh, what, are we prepared to actually uh, preserve our advantage in the space domain today? And if not, what, what do we need to do? I'm, I'm, I'm comfortable uh, that we can preserve our advantage today. Uh, uh, 
I think why it was so important to establish the Space Force and why it was so important to establish a U.S. Space Command was to be able to move at speed so I can say the same thing tomorrow and that, that I'm comfortable that I can deter five years from now or 10 years from now. Uh, I'm comfortable with where we sit today that we can protect and defend those capabilities. Uh, I think one of the things the, you know, the former national security strategy, previous national security strategy said, we will respond at a place, time and domain of our choosing and manner of our choosing. So it's not just space for space sake, uh, but it, it will be the full weight of the joint force in the nation, the whole, whole nation to be able to, to deter this uh, conflict from happening. Right, but in general, in history, I don't know of any uh, strategy of purely defensive so a purely defensive strategy that's deterred conflict. I mean, there's never been a castle built with walls high enough or thick enough that an adversary eventually doesn't decide to roll the dice and take it on. Mm -hmm. And typically they've been successful in the past. And so what I'm not hearing is any discussion of an ability to hold our adversaries' constellations at risk. So in the worst case scenario, if a, uh, a war were to break out between two countries, us and China, for example, or a conflict or some kind of conflict, uh, where uh, they were to come after our space assets and actually deminimize it, our, their ability to support our land, air, and sea forces, uh, would they still preserve their capability? And, and then we would have to fight them with all the advantages of space where we wouldn't have any advantages. Yeah, I think, uh, I think if you look at what, with what China, I'll talk specifically about mm -hmm. China, but Russia uh, similarly, but uh, with China, they're doing two things. They're largely building uh, a pretty robust set of space capabilities for their own use. So they have that same advantage that we have today, right. that we've enjoyed for right. you know, for decades. And, and they depend on them. And they, we do. and they depend on them, and, and they're becoming more dependent on them mm -hmm. uh, as, the, as the years go by. Uh, the other thing that they're doing is they're building uh, those capabilities to... Uh, to deny us our access, which we which we talked about, that's the resiliency part of it. And so I agree with uh, any military service; it, it can't just be one sided. Uh, we have done uh, some work on that, some design work on that as well. If you look at the if you look at uh, the U.S. Space Command mission statement, uh, it says uh, the UCP for 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 uh, U.S. Space Command says the U.S. Space Command commander shall uh, conduct offensive and defensive operations. Um, uh, I'll tell you, uh, uh, our first priority is a resilience priority, though, and that's that's been uh, the majority of our focus uh, for this year ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can we? I just want to pull it through just a little longer. You know, we, the Air Force tries to gain and maintain air superiority, not for the sake of air superiority, but so that they have freedom of maneuver in the air domain to be able to do close air support for the Army, or sink right. ships for the right. Navy, or mine harbors for the Navy, so they can support the joint force. Um, is there anything that you are thinking about as a from a requirements perspective that the Space Force would, would need to provide to U.S. Space Command for that commander to be able to gain and maintain space superiority in the space domain? Absolutely. There's, a, there's a, a lot of thought going in on that. And I would say not just from a U.S. Space Command perspective, but also from the other command, commands around the world. Just as you said, the Air Domain uh, thinks about being able to not just uh, provide capabilities just for the air domain, it, it, the space capabilities enable freedom of maneuver in all domains. Mm -hmm. And so, if you look at if you look at what the space force provides, uh, and I've said this before, with with about two and a half percent of of the budget, uh, or the entire Department of Defense budget, two and a half percent is is space force budget. Uh, if you look at the force multiplier effects of that, and what what those capabilities do for the Army and the Navy, uh, and the Air Force and the Marines. It is, uh, it's a huge force multiplier and we've got to be able to protect and defend those capabilities uh, uh, to make sure that they have, you know, their force, uh, force structure closes on what they have to do as well. Right. And so um, now kind of flipping the coin, the, uh, the Army depends on the Air Force for close air support mm -hmm. and the Navy depends on the Air Force for certain capabilities. Is there a demand function coming out of the Space Force to the other services to field capabilities that will help you gain and maintain superiority there, in your domain. Yeah, that you know that's one of this, the 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 requirements uh, work that we've got going on right now. We'll, we'll look at that as well. Mm -hmm. Clearly, as I've said in the past, if if and this is largely a U.S. Space Command mission, that's sure. not a, a Space Force mission. But if you look at uh, U.S. Space Command's ability to have 
uh, space superiority, it's going to require the full weight of the Joint Force. It, it's not just a space for space thing. It's going to require an Air Force, uh, an Army, special ops capabilities, Navy. It's the full weight of the Joint Force that's going to have to, and and uh, those requirements are, are are going to be critical. Yeah, that, that makes so much sense that uh, for a Joint Force to truly be joint, they got to be mutually supportive, right. use their strengths to enable the other. Right. That's great. But it also argues that you got to leave some space savviness in the other services as yeah. opposed to pulling it all into the Space Force. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, and, and that's what we've done. Uh, okay. We we have not, as I told uh, the Air Force chief uh, back when we first started, and this was uh, Chief Goldfein, mm -hmm. uh, is that, you know, as we look at how to stand up a Space Force, you know, we'll figure that out. We'll, 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 we'll get this right. Uh, one of the things that he had to worry about is what does an Air Force look like with an independent Space Force? And what we couldn't do is you can't break the other services uh, in standing up a Space Force. Uh, same thing holds true with the Army and the Navy. So as we've gone through this work with the other services to determine what pieces come over, we have made sure what comes over enhances our readiness, enhances our mission capability, uh, allows us to capitalize on, on uh, the human capital part of that in, in, a, in a way that will be uh, uh, helpful but yet leave uh, some expertise behind so they can get, so we can best integrate space into their services as well. So they and can, so there's a balance. They can we fulfill the demand. That's right. right. Excellent. That's right. Good. I loved your comment on allies and your work with them. You know, I, I, every other service chief has an easy counterpart. There's typically right. an Army, Navy, and an Air Force in, the, in right. our allies force structure. Um, there's, I don't know of any other space forces out there. How are you? How are you building those bridges to particularly our five eyes, but also our NATO allies? How are you building the bridges to have dialogues on space and maybe look at uh, opportunities to cooperate even more fulsomely than you have yeah, in the past? We, we are working very closely to develop those partnerships. Uh, historically, as you know, having, having you personally been in the NASA side and the mm -hmm. national security space side, NASA has had lots of partnerships in the yes. space business for years. Historically, on the, on the DOD side, we haven't had on the space Side, the strong partnerships that we that we need today we didn't need them it was a benign peaceful domain and as long as you could launch a satellite and it, it worked and and didn't die an infant mortality because it failed when it first got on orbit you were good to go that's not the case today when i when uh i was assigned to japan in 2011 i got there just months before the great tsunami uh earthquake tsunami fukushima, nuclear reactor right, disaster yeah. fukushima and i had a first-hand look at you know a joint task force, a joint support force that we called it, uh, called Operation Tamadachi, and and all that went in to support um, our, our our Japanese partners. Uh, that stuck with me, and when I came back, I, I kept thinking, you know, we don't have that same level of partnerships in in the space domain that we need. So we've been working this hard. I would say our, our and it's an area that we've made significant advances. You're right. There's no other space force chief. But in every one of the services that we deal with, every one of the countries we deal with, uh, because of their size, they have elevated space inside of the Air Force and made it kind of a hybrid. And so uh, if you look at the UK, if you look at uh, uh, Australia and, and uh, Germany and France, they have all stood up either space commands or, or uh, uh, reorganized their Air Force to, to address both. And so my counterparts largely are the space commands and service chiefs that are that have space responsibilities in their in their uh, countries you know just last year last april out in colorado springs there was a space symposium and i held a, a chiefs conference where we brought service chiefs in from across the across the world 22 chiefs came or their representatives mm -hmm. every continent except antarctica was represented and so uh i will tell you u.s leadership in space is resonating globally uh, we've got really strong partnerships and and what historically has been data sharing arrangements now has matured much more uh, to where this force design work that we're doing uh, we, we've shared that with our closest partners as well say okay where might we build this collaboratively mm -hmm. um, uh, we have we have put hosted payloads on on Norwegian satellites we've put a hosted payload we're getting ready to put hosted payloads on Japanese satellites we're uh, in in progress right now of, of uh, working a payload partnership with the UK to, to be launched uh, later this year. Um, and so we, we have matured these much more significantly than just given data. We exercise together, train together, operate together, operate uh, uh, 
command and control centers together, we have greater numbers of folks from our allies and partners in our in our centers and in our organization. So um, although there is still room to grow, significant room to grow, we have made over the last couple of years some really significant uh, advances. And again, the US leadership in space has really resonated with our allies and our partners. Great. Thanks, General Raymond. That's Thank you. A sort of force here, but I, I don't want to, I could ask questions all afternoon. I love talking about this stuff, but we owe our, our great audience here an opportunity to, to pitch in and Perfect. ask some questions. So uh, we'll turn it over to Lucas, who's going to moderate that for us. Lucas, who do we have on the line? All right. Thank you, sir. I think first we'll go to uh, Brian Everstein. Yes. Thank you so much for taking the time. Um, in, in case I didn't miss it, I, I was hoping to um, ask about progress under the rocket cargo vanguard, what you expect to see upcoming in the next year or so. And I just saw um, the AFRL had placed a contract with SpaceX for about 100 million under this. Can you explain anything on what you hope to see under this? Yeah, you know, so the, the rocket cargo um, work is really looking at exploring, is this feasible? And, and so AFRL is, is uh, uh, leading that effort with us, the Space Force part of, of AFRL, if you will, uh, is leading this. We, we are gonna look to explore concepts, explore uh, um, technologies to see if there's something there. Uh, we think there might be, uh, and that's really the work that will continue this, this next year to try to try to flush this out a little bit to see if there's some really relevant capability that we can do at, at a cost point and speed that, that makes it attractive. Is there anything you can say about this recent contract if you expect any more to come down the pipe? I, I don't have that off the top of my head, but I, uh, if you reach out to my office, I'll, I'll make sure that I, I can connect you with somebody that can give you those. Okay, great. Next, we'll go to uh, Yasmin from National Defense. Hi there, General. Thanks so much for doing this. Yasmin Tajde, National Defense Magazine. Um, you mentioned that you guys are going to be submitting a bold uh, budget request. I was wondering if you might be able to elaborate just a little bit more on what you mean by that. You know, is that asking for more funding? Is that asking for, you know, cutting edge technology? Could you elaborate a little bit more on what you mean by bold? Yeah, I, I, I probably can't because the budget isn't approved yet. And I, I, uh, that's, you know, probably not a, gr a great career move uh, to get ahead of the department. Uh, but I'll, I'll just tell you, it, it's bold and thinking and it's, and it's uh, a shift uh, in approach to more resilient architecture. And I'll, I'll let the budget speak for itself and, and wait for that to come out. Okay, and if you don't mind if I ask a follow-up question then, you know, you mentioned with the CR that I think you said it was affecting the transfer of some of the SATCOM systems from the services to the Space Force that was on hold. Are there any other things for year three that are being um, put on hold that are being affected by the CR? Yeah, I, I had the opportunity last week to testify with my fellow service chiefs in front of the Hack D on the impacts of a CR. And I tell you, there's, um, there's three big three big uh, impact areas. One is our ability to modernize. Uh, uh, as a new service with, with new ideas, uh, that requires new starts and without with a CR, you can't do new starts. And so our ability to modernize, to get to a more resilient architecture uh, will be hindered. Uh, there's a readiness aspect of this as well. As I, as I mentioned to you, uh, on the capabilities that we are bringing in from other services, we think that enhances our readiness. Uh, that won't be able to happen until we get a, a uh, a bill because you can't bring that in under a CR because that's a, a new start, if you will. Uh, and then there's there's um, uh, kind of the building of the service pieces of uh, that will be impacted as well because they're because they're new starts. And what I would tell you is, you know, uh, China is our pacing th uh, pacing challenge, and and we're focusing on that. Uh, what what I uh, you know, having the opportunity to to testify last week, it, it is clear that. That all the services have impacts, and and uh, uh, I know I know the appropriations committees that that we had the privilege of talking to and testifying in front of want to get a budget. I would encourage a budget. Uh, we cannot get left in the starting blocks. We've got to move at speed, uh, and I would encourage uh, Congress to pass a uh, an appropriations bill so we can we can get out of the starting blocks and, and keep running. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, next we'll go to uh, Sandra Irwin. Hi, good afternoon, um, General Raymond. Sandra Irwin with Space News. Um, I wanted to follow up on the uh, on your testimony on the CR and the impact of the CR 
the uh, the national security uh, space launch program you said that was going to be affected in a significant way can you be more specific for example if if we get a budget in february are, are there still going to be five launches next year or are you already cutting down on the number of launches just based on the delay in the budget and if there's a full year CR, will there be any launches at all? Can you give us a little bit more specifics on that? Thanks. Uh, if we if if we were to get a budget in February, we would continue with our five uh, our five excuse me <clears throat> our five launches. If we were into a long term CR, uh, we would uh, reduce two. We'd have to reduce two of those of those five uh, of those five launches, which would yeah. which you know we the way we do launches we procure launches two years in advance. As you know when 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 uh, you were there for space command commander so the the launches that would slip would be those launches we'd procure in 23 for launch in 24 we would then slip capabilities out to uh, being launched in, in 25 and that would have a ripple effect because those two then shift to another two and it, so it's more than just a a a, a one-year impact it would have a ripple effect for for uh years to come and uh, it's important that we we launch those capabilities that will have been built when it's time to launch so has, has the Space Systems Command already been looking at scenarios of what launches potentially they will delay? We we have, and uh, we know which launches uh, we would delay, and they're really important launches to us as we compete, deter, and win against Russia and, and China, our pacing challenge. And so, I again, I cannot stress enough the, the importance of, of getting a, a budget passed. Thank you. Okay, great. Next up, we have uh, Stephen Clark. Hi, General Raymond. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, I had a question on the uh, GSAP program. The uh, I'm sorry, Stephen, can you tell me where you're from? Yeah, from spaceflightnow.com, General. Great, thank you. Yeah, question on the uh, the GSAP program, the Geosynchronous uh, Space, Situation, uh, Space Situational Awareness Program. Uh, two more satellites launching later this week. Uh, I'm wondering if you could discuss, uh, you know, as much as you can about what you've learned about operating the first four GSAP satellites and what these next two will add to the constellation. Just uh, if you could offer, offer some context, please, on the importance of uh, this mission. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's a really, really important mission. In fact, I was uh, down at the Cape uh, when the first two launched, uh, and I was the, the 14th Air Force commander at the time. And, and what, what GSAP does is provide, the way I describe it as a neighborhood watch capability. It allows us to better understand what's going on in the domain, especially in a, a really critical orbit. Uh, uh, like geosynchronous orbit. And so historically, the way we have surveilled or had awareness of a domain is we've we've taken observations from from radars or optical uh, capabilities, and we've come up with an address in space, if you will, of objects. And we've been worried about uh, making sure two things don't collide, that 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 we can keep that domain safe for all, which is critical. Uh, but it's not sufficient. If you move into a warfighting domain, you have to have more knowledge than just where something is. You have to have some insights into what those capabilities are. And this neighborhood watch uh, uh, capability has provided us um, uh, a, a fuller look at what's in space, specifically in the geosynchronous domain. It's important for our operations and it's, it's gonna be really important as we move forward. So I'm excited to get those capabilities onto orbit. If I could follow up briefly, uh, these next two, are they offering, are they adding any new uh, capabilities or technology to, to My, yeah it you know it, it's important that we have and when you look at the geosynchronous domain it's a it's a, it's a very large uh, volume of space that you have to cover and this provides uh, additional capacity for us thank you okay, next we have uh, terry van heeren yeah g'day sir uh terry van heeren from australia um, how are you sir i'm very good thank you i'm retired now so i'm enjoying a different life Go easy. But I'd, I'd love to know your thoughts on this policy of integrated deterrence in space or how it applies in space and, and where do you see it playing out? Well, I think space is, is foundational to integrated deterrence, uh, integrated deterrence uh, strategy. And it's, it's an area, you know, it, when we look at integrated deterrence, it's, it's, it's not just the strategic deterrence thing, nuclear deterrence of old, but it's a, it's, it's broader than that. It adds, different domains to it. It adds space to the equation. It adds cyber to the equation. If you look at the deterrence calculus of imposing costs and denying benefits, it now gives some other tools to either amplify uh, uh, to amplify those messages. And so 
Uh, and it's not just that, it's also integrated deterrence with our allies and our, and our partners. So uh, I really believe space has, a, has an important role in that. Um, in fact, as I've mentioned a couple of times, we're uh, doing a, a deep dive tomorrow with, with uh, several of the other uh, four-star, more functional aligned forces like uh, US Space Command, US Cyber Command, uh, uh, NORTHCOM, which isn't a functional, and, and US Strategic Command to, to continue that dialogue and, and putting a little bit more uh, meat on the bone, if you will, of what this integrated deterrence uh, concept uh, looks like and how space uh, and others might might um, um, uh, be integrated into it as, as we go forward, and I, I think I think space is going to be a a really important part of that. Totally understand. So I suppose just my my point being is, does you think the allies start to need to start to force design around integrated deterrence in space to complement U.S. deterrence in space and um, and and build out an allied deterrence uh, network? I think I think that's I, I I agree with you on that. And then on the on the force design work, as you know, as we've worked closely over the years, we're we're taking the force design work that we're doing and sharing it with our partners. Because I think if we do this force design in a way, we can actually um, uh, increase the opportunities for allies to participate, increase the opportunities for for a broader set of the industrial base to to participate. And I think there's uh, value to both of us uh, in doing so. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Great to hear your voice. All right, uh, Frank Wolf. Yeah, hi, General. Uh, Frank Wolf at Defense Daily. Um, I was interested just in your um, comments on the AOA on GMTI, and I wondered uh, if you could just let us know, um, you know how that's going or when, when it's scheduled to, to sort of finish up. And um, as you probably know, the uh, uh, congressional uh, defense authorizers have put some um, restrictions in uh, in terms of, uh, I think it's 75% of the funding uh, for, for GMTI programs can't be obligated until they have a report on um, any redundancies and, and how this will uh, fit in with CAD C2. So I just wondered if you had any comments on that. Yeah, so uh, first of all, I'd say uh, GMTI is an important missionary and, and the Air Force made this decision a, a few years ago to shift off of a, a capability called JSTARS and shift to a multi-domain approach uh, to this because we think it's more relevant for the strategic environment that we face today. And so number one, the mission is critical. Uh, number two, what we said was when we took that mission over is let's work with our intelligence community partners and let's figure out where there might be some synergies because we don't want to duplicate. We don't want to we, we, we don't want to uh, spend a dollar wasted on doing something that, that we don't have to if somebody else is already doing it. We've, we've done that before, for example, um, with some um, space-based space space situational space. awareness capabilities. We were going to build capabilities back in 2016, a follow-on to a, to a space surveillance satellite, and I ended up killing it because uh, the NRO had a program that was going to meet our needs, so we, we partnered with them. So this force design work that we're doing, we're doing with the Intelligence Committee, we're doing with uh, the broader department, and uh, our goal is by... Uh, late spring of this year, uh, we will deliver a, a, some analysis, an AOA that will determine uh, how best um, to go about accomplishing this critical mission. Uh, they've made some great progress to date. The team is built, they're up and running and working. They're gonna do a, 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 a review in January th this month and the next couple of weeks uh, to their board of directors, if you will. And, and uh, I'm eager to get the results of that uh, in late, late spring timeframe to, uh, to affect the budget uh, in 24. Thanks. Uh, just in terms of the overall, uh, you said Secretary Kendall, I guess, has um, prioritized sort of tactical ISR. So I just wondered if there are any other efforts you might be able to talk about that are under sort of this umbrella of tactical ISR and, and fulfilling the Secretary's um, prioritization of that and how that effort's going. Right. So it, it's in the, you know, GMTI is the first part of that, if you will. Uh, but, but, um, we, we've uh, start, we've reached out to the other service. Uh, the our vice chief of staff of, uh, of the vice CSO is leading this for me. He's reached out to the vice uh, service chiefs of the other departments, uh, looking at building the effort, uh, the plan to pull all these pieces together and to take a, a more holistic look at the other uh, ISR types of capabilities uh, that are out there in all other domains and to see uh, see what the requirements are. 
And then once we, and, and doing this in conjunction with the intelligence community, and then once we get our arms around what the requirements are, we'll be able to address whether those requirements have been met or not. And then again, working with the intelligence community to figure out uh, the best way forward to address those that requirements that are left uncovered. Thanks. I think we have time for just one more question. All right, uh, Tara Kopp, you're up. Thank you. Um, hi, General Raymond. Hi, Tara. I wanted to get back to the uh, space data transport layer. Right. And just if you could elaborate on what sort of infrastructure you see will be necessary to, uh, to create that layer. Is it primarily space-based or ground-based? And then um, secondly, on the National Space Intelligence Center, uh, just what sort of time frame you foresee in standing that up and maybe some examples of areas of focus for the analysts that uh, you would base there? Yeah, so let me start with the first one, the, the, the Intelligence Center. We're working very closely with Congress and we'll have to see what the appropriations bill says uh, when that when that gets uh, um, when that gets uh, either finalized or not uh, with the CR work. But we'll, that'll that'll be a little bit of a pacing uh, of that and and not only a pacing but a uh, in timing and but also in scope of what and what we're able to do. Um, it is important um, that we build uh, a foundational level intelligence capability that that is focused uh, more sharply on space as well, and then having an operational an operational focus. And I've tried to address both in my comments that that we work really hard to do both. Uh, uh, robust the operational part with having intelligence professionals that are trained in the space domain they go through the initial training with with the with the space operators they understand that domain which is not the case is not how it was previously they we would bring uh, intelligence analysts and they kind of learn on the job we're now professionally developing those intelligence capabilities or experts to be able to to understand the domain and, and provide the operational level until that we need so it's both a foundational and a, an operational level um, Intel focus that, that we really want uh, to continue to mature. Um, on the data transport layer, um, uh, I you know clearly space capabilities um, uh, provide information and provide data. And I think one of the, the key uh, focus areas on any, any uh, future construct of JADC2 is being able to take data and transport that data and make sense of that data. And, and uh, primarily our focus will be focusing on what the space domain layer looks like, but it also has to integrate with, with the terrestrial layer as well. So it will encompass that as well. Well, we're out of time. And I hate to bring this to a close because I know there's a lot of questions. I could keep there. going for a long time. I know you could, and I would love it. But uh, uh, I know how precious your time is. Probably your most precious commodity as a chief of the service. And uh, chief, can't thank you enough for thank taking you. the time to come over here. And uh, in our, one of our key missions here at Mitchell Space is to facilitate the education of our audience about the importance of your service and your mission set. And uh, I don't know how we could do it better than with having you over here participating in this event today. I hope you'll make time in the future to come back. We yeah. certainly enjoyed having you. On behalf of, of General Deptula and the Mitchell Institute, I wanna thank you for your time. I'd yeah. like to thank you for your time. And, and as I said up front, we've been very blessed in uh, the space business to have, have you as our leader uh, for years. Uh, it's really it's really cool when you have somebody that's actually lived in the domain for a while to, to <laughs> be able to help us uh, do what we need to do to make sure that this domain stay, stay safe for all. And so you've been very valuable. I will tell you for me personally, though, the the mentoring that you've given me, and I've, I've, I, don't, I don't know if you mind if I share this story. I've shared it with you. I thank you for it. Um, uh, years ago, I was a young colonel, and I had just come back from a deployment at, uh, as the director of Space Forces at IUD. And I came back, and I was in my office. My real job was the ops group commander at Vandenberg, and I got this phone call saying, hey, General Chilton is going to go testify in front of Congress, and he wants you to go testify with him. And I'm thinking to myself, what does he want me to say? And <laughs> it, it, wasn't, it wasn't that. It was he wants you to be there, and he wants you to be able to see a testimony. And I remember uh, going to that with you, sitting on the back bench, watching that. And as I was leaving, you said something to the fact, I thank you for the opportunity. And you said, hey, uh, you know, uh, you're going to be doing this someday. And it, it's good to have had seen it and, and be able to start thinking about it. I remember thinking to myself, yeah, right, that, that'll never happen. I'll never be in that seat. And then just a few years later, I was in that seat. And I was the same hearing 
the same uh, Strategic Forces Subcommittee of the mm -hmm. Hask. Uh, and I remember driving away from that hearing and calling you and saying, sir, you know, I just did my first hearing. You're right, I did it. And oh, by the way, having had an opportunity to, to listen to you do that and see how you prepared for it and, and to see how you uh, uh, testified, uh, helped me. And thank so you. I just want to thank you for your continued support and leadership and, and mentorship and advocacy for a force that I'm very proud of, extremely proud of. And I will tell you, uh, uh, this, uh, the advances that have been made over the last couple of years have been remarkable. And the advances that we will make in the years ahead are going to be even more remarkable and, and uh, with your help. And so thanks very much. Thanks, Chief. And thanks to our wonderful audience for participating today.